AKC Master Hunter Test is the highest level of testing in the AKC Hunt Test Program offered at the local level. There's a wide spectrum of types of setups and test designs when it comes to a Master Hunter Test. This video represents just one Master Test on one particular weekend with one particular pair of judges. It is not meant to represent what you are guaranteed to see each and every weekend at a master test or even to suggest that this test is the standard. Every test is different and every judge has their own set of expectations. The goal of this video is to break down this test by the numbers and also give a perspective of what the judge's thinking was behind each series and what they actually saw from the dogs and handlers running the test. Two important points to make right from the start. First, this test was run just a week prior to a master national event. This could skew some of the numbers that we are looking at here as many professional trainers may have been en route to that event. Second, tests run on this particular property are not allowed to use live ammunition. This means no live flyer. Flyers really bring many factors into a typical test which the judges will not have the benefit of using. This can be a big omission and the judges will have to deal with that and come up with test designs that will at least test some of the behaviors typically created by a flyer in other ways. Unfortunately, incorporating a flyer was simply not an option for the club or the judges. This master test is to be run over two days. The entry limit on a two-day master test is 66. With a few dogs scratching from the test, 62 dogs started the weekend. So exactly what demographics made up those 62 entries in the test? Master test participants include both professional trainers and amateurs. In this test, 41 of the dogs or 66% were handled by an amateur as defined by the AKC. 21 dogs or 34% were handled by a professional trainer. Seven different breeds were represented with Labrador retrievers and golden retrievers making up the majority of the entries. There were also six chessies, one flat coat, one curly coat and one poodle. Dogs entered were pretty evenly split between male and female, with 30 males and 32 females entered. In this test, 33 of the dogs running have already obtained a Master Hunter title. The average number of passes already obtained by these entries was 13, with the median number being 6. The dog with the most passes had an impressive 118. The average age of a dog running this test was around five and a half years old, with the median being under five years. The youngest dog was under two years old, with the oldest being almost 12. There are three different series in a master hunter test, a land test, a water test, and a combination land and water test. These three series can be run in any order. From our experience, the land test is most often run first. Keep in mind that the first series will always have the most dogs running and a land test is typically less time consuming than the other series. There are not many guidelines on what specifically constitutes a land water test as long as the test incorporates both. But depending on the test, this series could be mostly land or mostly water depending on what the judges set up. As part of those three series, the overall test must contain certain elements. To test marking, the test must include multiple landmarks, multiple watermarks, and multiple marks over land and water. In at least two of the series, the marks must be a triple retrieve. In addition, one series must contain a walk-up. For blinds, there must be a land blind and a water blind. One series must incorporate a double blind in any combination. So in any test, there will be three blinds run. At some point, there must be a diversion shot or a diversion bird. 
This test incorporates a diversion shot, not a diversion bird. Lastly, each dog must honor another dog working. Let's take a look at the first series, which will be the land series. Elements included in this series will be a triple landmark with a walk-up, a diversion shot, and a double land blind. Let's watch one dog that did a nice job, run the land test, then we will break it down and explain all of the factors of the test. Nice. The diversion shot is fired as the dog returns from the long mark. The sound wasn't picked up well by our camera, but it was audible to the handler. Before we break down the elements and factors of this test, let's discuss why the test is oriented the way that it is. When the judges get to a test site and start to think about their tests set up, one of the major factors is the anticipated location of the sun during the test. The judges do try to avoid running directly into the sun where the dog would have an issue seeing the marks. Most often, the sun will also not be at the handler's back so that the dogs can see the handler's casts. This isn't always the case though. Some judges may want to have the sun illuminate and bring out the visibility of certain gun stations. 
For instance, if the sun were at the handler's back here, and the long gun station was not hidden, that gun station would be well illuminated, creating more of a check-down relationship between the short bird and the long bird. Ideally, the test would be oriented so that the sunrise or sunset does not impact the dog's visibility no matter what time of day they run. Keep in mind, that isn't always possible. Judges need to work with the land and water that they are given. The next consideration is the projected direction of the wind. Ideally, the judges would like the wind to not be coming at the handler and dog. If that were to happen, the dogs will most likely scent the marks and blinds and not give an accurate picture to the judges. In this series, there was a slight crosswind coming from left to right. The next factor is terrain. In this series, there is a slight left to right slope of the terrain. The video tends to flatten that out. Although it is not a dramatic slope, it is enough to influence the dogs on the longer mark. This test was set up to minimize the visibility of any of the gun stations. This view captures two of the marks and one of the blinds. When looking into the field, the judges did not want the dogs keyed in on bird stations. Although exposed bird stations can present their own challenges for the dogs, the judges prefer to hide the gun stations. All the handler and dog see is the field and some goose decoys. The same is true when looking in the direction of the third mark and other blind. There is also a gravel road running through the test. This wasn't set up to be any real factor for the test. Rather, it was just something the judges needed to work with. At this level, most dogs have no problem dealing with this. Next is cover. The cover in this field is fairly short and with few cover changes. There isn't much for the dogs to negotiate. The judges would have liked to have some cover patches to work with, but that just wasn't the case. The lower cover will also mean there won't be as much drag back scent as there would be with longer cover. The low cover was one of the considerations when deciding to make the middle mark a considerable distance. Let's take a look at each element, starting with the walk-up bird. The walk-up bird is not meant to be a particularly difficult mark. They have to be presented at a distance of no more than 45 yards. This one is 30. The walk-up of this distance is almost more an exercise in steadiness than it is a test of marking. There is no expectation that dogs will have a difficult time with this mark, but it will create suction on the longer mark and that is why it is being placed where it is. Remember, there is no flyer in this test, so the judges will try to create suction in other ways like this. Although the marks in this test can be picked up in any order, most handlers will send their dog for the go bird first, and then secondary select the walk up, which would be the shortest bird remaining. The handler should come out of the holding blind with the dog off lead and walk under reasonable control towards the line established by the judges. When they reach that line, the bird will be thrown. The dog must be steadied once the bird is in the air by either a verbal or whistle command, not both. The dog doesn't have to sit, but it does have to be steady and must remain so until released by the judges. Yeah. Bird number two is 132 yards thrown left to right. Since this is almost always going to be the third bird picked up, let's talk about the go bird first. The go bird is only 60 yards. Again, not a particularly difficult mark, especially since it is the go bird. Challenges are the lower visibility, since the bird never gets above the tree line, and a sizable dirt patch in front of the mark most dogs will probably try to cheat. The terrain also slopes away after the area of the fall, so overrunning the mark could cause problems. Now let's talk about bird number two, which was almost always the last bird retrieved. To run this mark clean, the dog will need to drive past the scent of the walk-up bird and the scent of the blind on the left. 
Because of the tightness of the test, the judges expected they would see at least some dogs lose their momentum, requiring the dog to be handled. One possibility is that the dog would start to hunt near the walk-up and try to head towards that old area of the fall, as we see with this dog. While the judges would have liked to see the dog not give in to the suction, the more important thing is how the handler and dog recover from it. In fact, over half of the dogs lost significant momentum in the scent of the walk-up on the right or blind on the left. Handlers dealing with this situation more successfully used voice with their cast to drive the dog through the scent. They also had to give the correct angle for the cast to account for the terrain, wind, and potential over-rotation of the dog caused by using voice on the cast. Without voice, many dogs did not drive out of the scent. This dog is a good example of what was fairly common. The dog needed the voice on the cast to finally drive out of the scent and back to the mark. With not enough angle and needing to use voice, there is a real possibility of the dog getting even further off course given the factors and rotation of the dog from using voice. Dogs taking a line too far left of the line to the mark run the risk of getting caught up in the scent of the blind as we see here. Even though the blind was not hot, there is plenty of scent in that area. Again, even though these few dogs gave into the suction, they did recover from that and would be moving on to the second series if all else goes well. So what did the variation in lines look like for this mark? Of the 62 dogs running this series, 39 or 63% needed to handle on this mark. A sampling of those lines are indicated in yellow and red. Yellow handled successfully, red did not. As predicted, dogs getting into the scent areas, either left or right, needed to be handled out. Dogs getting too immersed in the walk-up bird scent and were not able to be handled out, stayed right, and were eventually picked up. Very few dogs, less than five, took an absolute straight line to bird number two. The green lines represent the lines of dogs that did not need to handle on the mark. What's interesting is that you can really see the impact of the terrain and the wind on the mark. Many of the dogs that needed to handle on this mark did not have an easy go of it. The average number of casts needed to get to the bird was about 5.6. The average number of refusals was 2.8. Let's look at the first land blind. In this test, the two blinds could be run in any order. Most, if not all, chose to run this blind first. This was a very basic land blind with not a lot of factors to deal with. The bird is near the base of a tree. With very few factors to deal with, the judges are expecting handlers to challenge the blind and keep their dogs within a tight corridor to the blind. If dogs get outside of that corridor, they will need to be brought back online quickly. For purposes of this video, a whistle sit and cast are counted as one cast. Using this method, the average number of whistle sits and subsequent casts was 2.5. The average number of refusals was around one. The second land blind is about 80 yards. What's different about this blind than what you typically see is that this blind is in the open field, not a tree line or base of a tree or any other real destination through a group of decoys with the bird laying in a slight depression. Deep enough so that the bird doesn't stand out too much, but not too deep for the dog to have difficulty locating it once in the area.
There is also no blind stake at the bird, only a small ribbon placed close to the ground. Let's watch this dog run the blind with only a few casts. Then we will watch a few others that give in to some of the factors. The judges expect the dog to be handled all the way to the blind. This dog showed nice control at the end of the blind. The handler did not just let the dog hunt. One tendency of the dogs was to head straight for the tree line, convinced that the bird had to be at the base of the trees. Once in the tree line, it was not an easy task to get them back into the field. Also, although this dog did not do so, since there was no real visible target, there was a tendency for some dogs to start auto-casting in search of the bird. Many of the dogs also gave in to the influence of the two prior marks thrown in the field. The handlers had to be quick on the whistle to get their dogs back on a reasonable line to the blind. Again, even though the judges would like to see the dog not give in to the factors, it is just as important how well the dog recovers. Using the same criteria as the first blind, the average number of whistles and subsequent casts on this blind averaged almost five, with the median being around four. Average number of refusals was 2.4, with the median being two. Let's look at the total results from the land test. A total of 50 dogs will make it through to the second series with 12 being dropped. Six of the dogs ran into trouble handling on the marks with just too many refusals to make it through. Three dogs returned to an old fall, which was always the walk-up bird. One dog popped multiple times on the marks. One handler picked up their dog on the second blind. One dog had to be handled on two of the marks and was zeroed out for marking. Surprisingly, although there was some creeping, not one dog broke on the marks. Although there are a good number of dogs going to the second series, <coughs> many will have to make up some ground in the next series. 14 dogs had very marginal marking scores. 11 had very marginal scores on the blinds. They will need to show the judges some improvement in the next series or risk being dropped. The second series will be the Land Water Series. The second series will be a triple retrieve with two birds across the water, but landing on land and somewhat of a breaking bird in the water at only about 20 yards. There will also be an honor. This series will really test the steadiness of the dogs. The middle mark will again be the most challenging given its placement, which we will explain. With 50 dogs coming to the second series, it will start on day one and continue in the morning of day two. None of the marks are particularly long in this series and should probably go reasonably fast. The handler came out of the holding blind and was required to be seated. This is an option in a master test that many just do not train for, unless they also run HRC tests. With the honor dog honoring on the left, the first mark, again from a hidden gun station, is thrown across the corner of the pond to the far bank. The second bird comes left to right from behind a group of trees on the far shore. The flat light and the limited time the bird is visible in the air makes this mark a bit of a challenge. The mark also has an angle entry and an angle exit, which may cause some dogs to square up either one or both. On route to the mark, there is a very small island with some cover. Dogs will have to persevere over that island to take a straight line to the mark. Dogs with less training may attempt to beach early. While we would expect that more experienced dogs take a straight line, or even take this mark a bit watery to avoid the shore. <laughs> the 
The go bird is a hand-thrown 20-yard breaking bird. We had what five or six that have broken on this already. Yeah. So we're down to forty. Uh, probably three. Probably forty-four. We had two break today. We had a bunch two? yesterday. Yeah. So we'll, do, we'll be in the low forties that to run the third series. Mm -hmm. So. No problem on the first two marks. Now let's see how the dog does on the middle bird. The dog takes a nice straight line over the island, but then stops a little short of the bird and starts to hunt before getting back into the water. We're taking the obstacle. <laughs> Handler gets the dot on the bird with a few casts. All in all, 15 dogs needed to be handled on this middle mark. Here is an example of a dog that squared both the entry and the exit somewhat but still ended up marking the bird nicely. And finally, here is an example of how some of the dogs stayed watery on the middle mark.
The dispersion of the lines on the middle mark was very wide, with more dogs going left of the island and land grabbing a bit early than the dogs that went straight to the mark or right. Again, the yellow lines are samples of the lines of the dogs that were handled. The red lines indicate the lines of the dogs that were picked up. Although this doesn't represent every dog, it is a good representation of the variance in the lines taken. Dogs had some steadiness issues on the breaking bird with a total of eight dogs breaking, two of those while on honor. Eel. Bird two. There was also a good amount of creeping, with the handler needing to reheal the dog before sending. Eel. As the land water series wrapped up, 39 dogs will be going through to the third series. 11 were dropped. Six broke while in the working position, two broke on the honor. Three dogs were dropped for refusals while handling on the middle mark. A handful of dogs have now handled in both the first and second series. They will need clean marks in the third for the judges to be satisfied with their marking abilities. Keep in mind, despite some opinions on the subject, there is no rule against handling in more than one series. The judges took into account whether handles were within or to the area of the fall. There will be another triple retrieve thrown in the third, which isn't always the case. Remember, only two series are required to have a triple. The water series will take care of the remaining required elements of the test. Multiple marks on water and a water blind. Again, the marks are relatively short, but two of these marks are in heavy cover, making the birds more difficult to find and creating a lot of drag back scent. The blind will be quite a challenge with the factors and multiple danger zones where the handler could lose sight of their dog if handled poorly. Ready? The marks will be thrown from right to left around the horn. The first bird is hand thrown. Although the dogs will need to persevere through vegetation, the bird lands on mostly solid ground. Bird two is also hand thrown and lands in a pocket of water in the vegetation. The expectation is that less experienced dogs may be influenced by the first mark to the extent that they may end up grabbing land a bit early. Highly trained dogs may take a straight line or error on the watery side of the line. Bird three is thrown left to right over the peninsula through a small group of decoys. There is a corner of water that the judges would like to see the dogs not cheat, although doing so would probably only result in a lower perseverance or trainability score and not elimination. 54.
The blind is about 80 yards. The expectation is that the handler will keep the dog on line to the blind over the peninsula. Avoiding the peninsula would not be acceptable. Additionally, there are three danger zones where the handlers could lose sight of their dogs if not handled correctly. The first is to the left side of the peninsula after the dog enters the water. If a handler sees their dog heading to the right there, it would serve them well to stop the dog on the peninsula and handle away from that danger zone. The second is around the back side of the island to the left. Get too far left and the dog will be out of sight. The third is behind and to the right of the peninsula jutting out from the far side of the pond. Again, once in that area, the dog will not be visible. The handlers will need to keep their dogs on line to the blind and out of the danger zones to be successful. The average number of casts on this blind was over five, with the median being just over four. The average number of refusals was under two, with the mean being about 1.4. In the end, 33 dogs were awarded qualifying scores for the weekend. Six were dropped in the third series, two for lack of marking, and four for too many refusals on the blind. As the test wraps up, handlers are awarded their qualifying ribbons and head home. As stated at the beginning, the purpose of this video was to illustrate one particular test on one particular weekend with one particular pair of judges. What you see from test to test will vary. Some judges may be more or less forgiving with scoring. Some tests will have more concepts than others. Pass rates will vary. Our hope is that this video gives those unfamiliar with master hunt tests and would like to aspire to run them a better idea of what the tests look like and what they need to train for. Until next time, happy training.